Odell Beckham has a few people upset. The NBA Finals are over. Is there a new sheriff in town? Racism in sports. The Brooklyn Nets are preparing for the NBA draft. Tina Charles is making moves. And who and what are off topic this week. All that and more on What's the 411 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, after a week being away from you, I'm glad to see your face. It's good to be back. <laughs> Great to see you. And I'm glad to see your faces out there in our audience, our friends. But let's just get right to it. We're, let's talk about the NBA Finals. The Golden State Warriors were once again crowned NBA champions. Mike, what were your takeaways from this series? Well, this was the series for Kevin Durant. You know, this was he made the decision to go to Golden State, and it was really validated by the performance that he put on in these five games in this NBA Finals. And of course, a guy like Steph Curry, who's now sort of playing second fiddle for these Warriors, but it, it's, it's not about that. This is the best team. They proved it, and as we pointed out, you know, many times they're a super team. They went ahead, they got it done, and congratulations to the Warriors. And then, real quickly, for LeBron James, I mean, look, I know the Cavs lost in five, but what a phenomenal job by. LeBron James. The, the problem for him was that Golden State was just too much to handle. It was an entertaining series despite the fact that it only went five games and some of the games in Golden State were kind of lopsided, but for the most part it was entertaining and I think that the people who were saying that super teams are not good for the NBA not necessarily true. I think that the Golden State Warriors now have shown, look now to be the best, you got to beat the you got to beat the best and hopefully some other teams will try to go ahead and round up some, some super teams of their own. Yeah, I think Kevin Durant in this series proved that he didn't join the super team or I guess it was the super team in a sense to a little lesser degree of the Warriors just to passively collect the chip. He came to to prove to everybody that he is just as much a part of them winning the ring than um, anybody else on the team. So I think, you know, for him, it, it's it's kind of tricky because you want to congratulate him for winning the, the ring because that is an accomplishment. But there's this sense that he did what he was supposed to do. It, the Golden State Warriors were heavily favored to win just because of the, su the superpowers that Kevin Durant brought to an already stacked team. But So it's kind of it's weird. You know, I don't want to have an asterisk on the championship win. But I do you know, wish him congratulations. It was something that he worked hard hard for and he put himself in a great position to do. LeBron James, what can, what can you say? I mean, the the talk is going to be where is he in terms of the greatest of all time? Is he beat MJ? And you know, there's going to be a lot of discussion back and forth about it, but you cannot take away he averaged a triple double in the series and I I don't think that he's the first to to ever have done that. And now it's going to be what happens in the off season? Because of course the Warriors will be once again the team to beat for another couple of years because of KD, Steph, Clay, Draymond being under contract for the next couple of years. So this could conceivably continue, but it's now up to the Cavaliers on how to combat that. And they're in an unfortunate situation where they don't have a lot of wiggle room to acquire some of the pieces that they need because they didn't get a lot of consistent help from their supporting cast. I was, you know, Kevin Love had an iffy series at times. Kyrie and everybody else was streaky. So we'll see. Melo, Paul George, we'll see where the chips land. We wrapped up the NBA Finals, and unfortunately there was an incident that cast a shadow before the series even began. NBA superstar LeBron James' Los Angeles home was vandalized when someone gra graffitied the N-word over his gate. Now, this is the second time in about a couple months where we had an incident of racism in sports. You know, bring to mind the Adam Jones incident in Fenway Park. So, Mike, uh, I ask you, you know, where do you you think we are in terms of in sports and community when it comes to race relations and also this is the 50th anniversary of the, what is termed as the Cleveland Summit Summit which was hosted by James Brown uh right Jim Brown yep Jim Brown and included prominent black athletes like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell who met um to discuss Muhammad Ali being a conscious object um conscientious objector. So, Mike, give me your thoughts. 
You know, Keisha, I think a lot of these examples that we've seen in sports over the la course of the last couple of months, as you pointed out with what happened with LeBron James and what happened with, with Adam Jones, I think it shows really how divided this country is right now. And I think what's happening, and this isn't necessarily something that's just beginning with Donald Trump's presidency. This is something that's been festering for some time now. It seems like there's this growing hate movement throughout this country. And it's not necessarily just against the African-American community. It's also against Muslims. It's also against, you know, anti-white, anything that, you know, foreigners. And I would even include women in the mix. The big issue here, though, I think for the black community is that they're facing this, this unfair war against law enforcement that's going on throughout the whole country. And it's not safe. In other words, for black people, when you're driving in a car, getting pulled over, things like that. For me, what I've seen, and I would even tie in the whole Colin Ka Kaepernick situation with some, not necessarily the fact that he hasn't been signed by some of these teams, but some of the comments that have been made by fans. And I think that there are a lot of white people here in this country that are out of touch, that don't necessarily what it, it's like to be a black person in America. Even as a white person, I don't understand what it's necessarily like to be a black person in America. And I think... You know, there's this this clash. This country is very divided right now, uh, and it's tough to see. It's tough to see what is going on in, with some of these incidents. And the last thing I'll say, the thing that happened with LeBron James, it's disgusting. It's appalling. I don't know if they actually have caught the culprit, but it's stuff like that that makes me sick to my stomach. Yeah, I, I'm going to try to get all my thoughts in in the lot of time that we have. It, in, in, it's going to be a little hard because I've got a lot of things on my mind and a lot of things to say. But I will say that sports, once again, has always has been thought of as a microcosm of society. And here we have an incident where, you know, as you mentioned before, racism really transcends you know, economic status. And LeBron James uh, mentioned it when he was asked after the incident happened, and I'll paraphrase what he said, but he said, you know, no matter how much money you make, no matter how many successes that you have, being black is still hard in America. And we see that he had this incident where, you know, society will praise athletes and entertainers for the service that they provide. But that's where it seems to be where the, their value lies. That's it. The minute that you seem to be too successful or you you do something that's maybe a little outside of the norm there's always someone or a group of people that will let you know you're out of place you you don't have that right to step outside of the box that we want to put you in and we saw that with the former president barack obama he here is a highly intelligent man who had a night a great resume going into the presidency the leader of the free world but he was he and his family were not above um reproach when it came to people spewing racist hate and so in in sports especially in leagues with like the nba and the nfl where african americans are the mi the ma majority they're fighting against the minority and in in our normal world, we would call the one percenters. And the one percenters in these sports leagues are the team owners and the executives. A lot who do not look like the people who bring them the money. And we see with uh, Colin Kaepernick, what happens when you do something that they don't like? You are supposed to play your sport. You're supposed to succeed in it. You're supposed to bring them money. But when he, when Colin Kaepernick took a stand against something that affected his community, we ha he hasn't had a job since. And, you know, a lot of it has been, you know, people will say he hasn't proven himself to be as good of a player as some other people, which I think is a little bit of nonsense. But there are there's another faction where they say they don't want to deal with the distraction. And, you know, how do you, how do you do that? How do you combat that? And I feel as though the NBA seems to be a little bit more on the forefront, more um, contemporary when it's dealing with these um, types of issues. Because we had LeBron in the Miami Heat after the Trayvon Martin incident where the hoodies, and they weren't silenced. You know, they weren't benched the next day. They weren't cut. And so, you know, it's now up to NFL and, and MLB to, to catch up. And I'll, I'll wrap up by saying that I wonder what 
life would be like if we had a modern day Cleveland summit, if we had LeBron James, a Colin Kaepernick, um, maybe David Ortiz, you know, people who are minorities who are at the top of their professions come together. And what would make even more powerful is if you have a Peyton Manning, a Tom Brady, a non-minority who's at the top of the game, stand in, uni in unity and, you know, create a, a, a movement and see what, what happens. You know, things really need to get shaken up. Yeah. And hopefully... One day we'll see that. <laughs> well, don't go away because when we come back, we're in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report. Our photo of the week is of Freddie Perry with his twin brother. They both recently graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee with master's degrees. Freddie received an MBA and his brother received a master's in education. Congratulations. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, Keisha, my New York Yankees have been tearing up the AL East, but there's still some cause for concern for Masahiro Tanaka, who has been struggling throughout the whole throughout the whole season. Despite the fact that he did have a quality start against the Anaheim Angels, Keisha, uh, there's still something that isn't right with Tanaka. And I ask you, why has he pitched so poorly this season, and how will this impact the Yankees as they go the rest of the way? Well, that is the million dollar question, Mike, and I still don't have an answer. <laughs> and neither do the Yankees, apparently. The Yankees general manager, Brian Cashman, said that they performed their own version of CSI Bronx. They've done extensive research on how and what is wrong with Tanaka. They've tweaked some mechanics, and other than that, there doesn't seem to be any known injury. So it just seems to be mental at this point. And I don't know how athletes get over mental blocks. I don't know if they use sports psychologists, a hypnotherapist, a psychoanalyst, meditation, yoga. I don't know what they do. But he's got to figure out what his hurdle is since it doesn't appear to be physical. And get, get right. Get the mind right. And the body will follow. And if not, then he's going to have a first-class ticket to the bench, and the Yankees will be in the position, I guess, of the next man up, right? Exactly. And, you know, if you took Tanaka out of the equation, the Yankees would have the lowest ERA in all of baseball. The problem is that he hasn't been providing the consistency that they need. Now, one thing is he does have a little bit of momentum going. He did have that quality start earlier in the week against the Angels, but I didn't necessarily get a chance to see it. It was late at night, and it was on during the Game 5 of the NBA Finals, so it was a little bit tricky to watch. But I think there is a little bit of momentum from, from that standpoint. However, how is he going to go ahead and face these brutal lineups that you have to deal with in the American League East with the Orioles and the Red Sox? He still has a lot of starts remaining against some division foes. This could cast a black cloud for the Yankees, who have had a very successful season thus far. But as we go throughout the rest of the way and up until the All-Star break, hopefully for Yankee fans, myself included, Tanaka will be able to get things right. And, you know, he is really their ace, or at least they hope so. Can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner yeah. soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Hey, going out like that? Yeah, why? Well, um, what would the neighbors think? <laughs> Look what I have. Mr. Bird, remember? Bark, bark, bark. We're just playing. We're just playing. I'm trying to get you out of here. Even still. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Well, well Keisha, now we go to your buddy, Odell Beckham Jr. While the Giants held their voluntary OTAs last week, 
Odell Beckham didn't show up and all the birds were chirping. Fortunately for Odell, he did show up this week to the Giants' mandatory minicamp. Keisha, I ask you, was Odell Beckham Jr.'s absence last week at the OTAs, is that a, are people making a mountain out of a molehill, or is that a major problem that could affect their season come 2017? So, Mike, I must admit that at first I did not like the optics of Odell not being at OTAs because I feel as though he had missed some of the other little gatherings that the rest of his receiving core did. He didn't go to the Eli Manning passing mini camp, and then this is another incident. And I think there might have been another event in between the Manning camp and OTAs that he missed. And I guess I'm still have a sour taste in my mouth from last year and how they didn't seem to be on the same page. And so I just thought that it's a nice opportunity for Odell to further the chemistry between himself and Eli and his his receiving core. So then I had to stop and think and have a little talk with myself and I said, self, is it really a big deal? Because as you mentioned, OTAs are voluntary and Olivier Vernon, the star of the, one of the stars of the defense, also did not participate in OTAs. Voluntary is just that voluntary and Odell Beckham Jr. is just probably one of these freaks of nature where he he probably doesn't have to go he can just wake up and you know go score a couple touchdowns and then also there was a little buzz that maybe his holdout was due to some contractual stuff going on because he's only set to make about 1.8 million dollars this year well, he certainly is underpaid, but he'll get his money when the day comes. I think he handled it very well when he talked to the media earlier in the week. And as you pointed out, it is voluntary. And the thing is, it's not like Odell Beckham was out in Europe or on a beach somewhere, you know, you know, relaxing, not doing anything. He was working out. He was getting right. I mean, in his interviews with the media earlier in the week, he talked about how bad he wants to be a great player, and he's also talked about how the Giants are on the same page where they want Odell Beckham Jr. to be a, a Giant for life, so hopefully this will all work out. I know we're both Giant fans, yes. and he's one of the players that we know they need him to be there if they're going to have success. So, And one of the places where he was during OTAs was, not, was near my office, but I missed him. <laughs> So we're going to move from MetLife Stadium to our home borough of Brooklyn, New York. And according to Nets Daily, it looks like Brooklyn Nets general manager Sean Marks is racking up his frequent flyer, flyer miles by jet setting all across Europe to countries like Spain, Germany, Turkey, Russia. And he's come stateside. His, he and his team have traveled to Chicago for the pre-draft combine, and they've attended pro days in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Now, you know, Mike, when you start acquiring new talent, it means you have to start releasing some of the people currently on your roster. So when looking at the Nets roster, who are five people that the Nets must keep? Well, I think Isaiah Whitehead was someone who came in last year. They went ahead and drafted him, and I thought he was pretty productive. And also, you want some of these homegrown products to be able to consistently be with the franchise that drafted them. Karis LeVert was also another draft pick from last season. He, showed, he didn't necessarily show the promise that we were looking for, but I think you want to hold on to some of these draft picks that you've taken. And then, of course, Rondé Hollis-Jefferson, who's been sensational defensively for the Nets. That's another name that I think, of course, the top two names is, are Brooke Lopez, and then I'll end it with this. Keisha, we can speculate all we want about who the Nets are going to take in the draft and who they're going to wind up going out in free agency, but Jeremy Lin is the most important player as they head into next season. He had an injury plague 2016-2017 season, and not only is it important for them to go ahead and try to compete with Jeremy Lin, but it's also important for them to market the team and try and sell tickets. Well, I had number one. My, You know, I'm supposed to be uh, impartial, but I just can't help it. Brooke Lopez. That, I just... There's just something about him that I just really like. I don't know what it is. It's not like we have coffee or drinks or anything, but there's just something that I really like about him as a person. And I, <laughs> and he's just proven to be such an anchor for that team. He's the vet of the, the squad. He's been there for or however long, many, many years. And he his skill set is just really outstanding, I, I find. And in a game that seems to be shifting away from the big man, he, is, he still has that post-up presence that I think is really lacking and beneficial to teams, and he can shoot from the outside. So I'm going to keep Brooke Lopez. Jeremy Lin, you mentioned Lin Sanity. If nothing else, you get butts in the seat. You know, yeah. <laughs> he creates um, 
excitement and electricity, and he's a good player on top of that. I think you keep Trevor Booker. Uh, he's another veteran of the team, and I love his energy when he comes off the bench. And as we saw in the NBA series, you really need production off your bench, and I think Booker helps uh, meet that need. And then Sean Kilpatrick, another person I like. I love his energy. He fights. Yeah, SK. SK, as they say in the in the Barclays. Um, I love his energy. You can tell he just really it puts everything on the court. And that's infectious. If It's infectious amongst his team. It's infectious amongst us who watch. So you keep him. And then I think you mentioned Isaiah Whitehead. Yep. yep. I think you keep Isaiah Whitehead. So we're going to switch from the men to the ladies in New York and the New York Liberty. So in a recent game against the Dallas Wings, forward Tina Charles scored a career-high 36 points to lead the New York Liberty uh, to a 93-89 win over the Wings at Madison Square Garden. Charles scored 11 of her points in the fourth quarter to close out the win. The Liberty trailed. 64-57 in the third quarter, but finished the period on a 14-2 run and never trailed again. Shavante Salas pitched in with 27 points, and Kia Stokes had 13 points and a career-high 15 rebounds. In addition, in addition, Tina Charles, she's, she had quite a week because she was named, along with Diana Tarazi of the Phoenix Mercury, um, WNBA players, Eastern and Western Conference Players of the Week, respectively. Diana Tarazi in the Western Conference. For games played May 29th to June 4th. Good time. Yeah, good for them. At least we have one team <laughs> <laughs> with the New York in their name and basketball that's winning. Go girls. I love it. I love it. Wow. These are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. <laughs> mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner oh. soon. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Hey, going out like that? Yeah, why? Well, um, what would the neighbors think? <laughs> I see you! Come look at Mr. Feather! Look what I have. Mr. Bird, remember? Bark, bark, bark. We're just playing! We're just playing! I'm trying to get you out of here! Even still. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Mike, we have a little news that mixes movies and sports. The great Al Pacino has agreed to star as former Penn State football coach Joe Paterno in an HBO film about the Jerry Sandusky scandal. Barry Levinson, who won the Academy Award for Rain Man, will serve as a director and executive producer. It's been six years since famed actor and director Bill Duke stunned audiences with his documentary, Dark Girls. He returns with the same impact and controversy through Created Equal, an independently produced legal thriller. The controversial film doesn't set out to challenge the Catholic Church, but asks a very modern question. Should women be allowed into the seminary to study for the priesthood? Why not? I think women are naturally nurturers, and I think priesthood kind of is an extension of that. So why not? Don't be hating on the women, okay? So <laughs> we'll move on to uh, the track and field. And track star and gold medalist Sonia Richards-Ross is opening up about having an abortion in her memoir called Chasing Grace. At the time, she was engaged to her now husband, Aaron Ross, 
who played for our New York Giants. And you know, the choice stemmed from Richards Ross not wanting to let down her sponsors and family and church by having a child at a wedlock. And it was a decision that both she and Aaron made together as a couple. And she also dropped a little nugget, or maybe it's a bombshell, when she stated that she doesn't know a female track athlete who hasn't had an abortion. Wow. That is, yeah. That's, that's some heavy stuff. Hey, you going out like that? Yeah, why? Well, um, what would the neighbors think? <laughs> Look what I have. Mr. Bird, remember? Bark, bark, bark. We're just playing. We're just playing. I'm trying to get you out of here. Even still. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. <laughs> mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. As you know, nearly every week, we put people who are misbehaving on the bench, and if they're really misbehaving, they get in that doghouse. Mike, who's going on the bench this week? Keisha, former NBA player Sebastian Telfair, belongs in the doghouse. Police busted him on gun charges after he was found with four loaded handguns and a bulletproof vest. Telfair, a Brooklyn native, went straight from Brooklyn's Lincoln High School to the NBA in 2004 when he was drafted by the Portland Trailblazers. He's played for several NBA teams, Keisha, but in 2014 he went to China where he played for a team over there. Most recently he was released by the Oklahoma City Thunder. Overall, Keisha, this was a very bad look for our Brooklyn native, Telfair. Yes, I mean, four loaded guns, bulletproof vests, and I think I saw the picture that even had ammo. I, I don't even know where he was going with all that stuff, but yeah, I don't think it could be good. So hopefully he will right this wrong, but woo-wee. Well, Mike, it's time to say goodbye to all our TV friends. I don't want to, but I have to, or else I'll get in trouble, they'll shut off the lights, I can talk to you all day. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of this guy, Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for hanging with us this week, and we look forward to hanging with you again next week.